What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 380. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources. And joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. How are things? Did you have a steak this week? Uh, no, I actually didn't have a steak. Uh, though a lot of people mentioned that they tried the recipe. Though I got some feedback on it too. So I think if you, uh, you know, if you want to try play testing it, you can certainly make some adjustments. Um, I did get to stream this week for the first time in a while. So that was, that was nice. I had a good time watching your stream. I certainly missed it. Uh, you know, when I'm cooking, I, I do a fair bit of cooking myself. Yours is just, you know, you're one of my go-to streams to watch while I'm up. Whenever your stream's up, I'm always, I'm always watching. It was really nice to, uh, to see that you were back in action. Are you, uh, you going to be, you going to be streaming more? What's, what's your plan for yeah, that? Yeah. The, the plan is to like aim for about once a week. And if I have time, maybe, you know, get in a couple, uh, apparently the news that, uh, vintage leagues are coming to magic online will actually increase my desire to stream as well, because I just love playing vintage. So it's, it, it could draw me out at pretty much any time. Wow. Okay. That's cool. Well, looking forward to it. And uh, of course you can find his stream at twitch.tv slash LSV any old time. All right. Uh, we've got a lot of cool stuff lined up for this episode of limited resources, including a special guest. We've got a showdown that's going to happen later on. And of course, some interesting level up topics before we get to that though, I want to mention our sponsor channel fireball dot com. This is the place to go on the internet for everything you need magic related. If you need sealed product, for example, Modern Masters 2017 edition, which by the way, I have in my hands here uh, for our cracker pack this this show. So that's going to be sweet. Uh, you can find it at Channel Fireball. You can also find singles, anything you need to fill out those decks, uh, you know, whatever format you're playing, look it up and you're going to find it. You can sell your cards back to them if you do a bunch of Modern Masters 2017 drafts with your friends and you end up with a big pile of cards that you might not have an immediate use for. You can send them back to Channel Fireball. They'll buy them and uh, process it very quickly for you. And if you want to trade them in for more stuff, you'll even get a 30% bonus on that. And of course, on top of that, awesome free content, videos, uh, articles, even podcasts from some of the best players in the world. Learn from the best. You can do it right there on channelfireball.com. Also, the show is brought to you by you via the Patreon. You can visit patreon.com slash limited resources for all the information. It's just a great uh, service and website. It's been up for a few years now, and uh, it's really opened the door for a lot of awesome content creation, including this show and uh, and many others in the Magic community and beyond. Um, all the details are there. It's really easy to sign up. There's no commitments or anything you can change or cancel, add, whatever it is that you want to do to your pledge uh, at any time, and uh, and you can always modify it whenever. There's no commitment with it, and uh, you get some cool perks. One of them is that you get to answer uh, put questions in for the Patreon question of the week. Before we get to that, though, why don't we bring in our special guest? Because uh, this person, of course, has been on the show multiple times and uh, it is a fan favorite, to say the least, super streamer and leader of the Rat Pack, Owen Turtenwald. Owen, welcome back to the show. I'm happy to be here. The Rat Pack, buddy. I've been watching your stream a ton. Speaking of streaming, man, you've been really lighting it up. Oh, yeah. I've had a couple of days in a row of not much else to do, and I figured I would try to go hard on the streaming front, and uh, people seem to like it. Yeah. Have you have you been enjoying it? I'm curious, just because like I've been loving it. I, I think that your personality translates to the stream really well, like you're funny, and like I've known you for a long time now, but you know, most of the time when people see you, you're on camera playing magic where you're in business mode, but you know, when you're away from the table, you have a much different vibe. You know, you're, you're a lot more silly and funny, and I think it comes through on your stream a lot. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun to do because it's me playing magic in a semi-competitive setting, but also me being just me. As opposed to when I play at a Grand Prix or at a Pro Tour, my objective is to give away no information and be stone-faced. And mm -hmm. having fun and being stone-faced are, are not – they don't play well together. No, they don't. <laughs> but uh, but it's been really fun watching your stream. And, of course, I'll, I'll put the link in the show notes to where people uh, can, can find your stream if they want to check it out. Um, you know, it's really easy on Twitch. All you have to do is uh, you can follow the person and then whenever they go live, you can set it so that you'll be uh, notified of it. And then you'll just know, oh, Owen's live and you can go check it out um, uh, and, and watch his stream. And, and I do highly recommend it. And I am, in fact, 
a member of the Rat Pack. Okay, let's get to uh, let's get to the question here. And Owen, if you have anything to say here, you're a guest host, so just go ahead, feel free to throw stuff in whenever you want. Um, this one comes from Sigurd, who says, "Hey guys, as a father and student, my financial situation keeps me from playing Magic Online on a daily basis, and even drafting is something I have to save up for. I really love the game, and I use it as both a tool to relax and steam off, but also as a challenge." I like steam off, by the way. That sounds sweet. Um, Yeah, I was trying to figure out exactly what that means. Yeah, I've definitely done that. Um, I have tried for months to improve, but feel like the only thing I can really do is play a lot of games. And since I don't have the opportunity to do this, I'm kind of stuck in my learning curve. Any tips at improving without playing the game? Articles to read, videos to watch, etc. He says, thanks for your contribution to the Magic community. You guys are my all-time favorites in both the booth and in my ears. Sigurd from Norway. Thank you, Sigurd. We appreciate that. Uh, This is an interesting question because, you know, like, Owen, I'll start with you. I I mean, isn't the first thing that you say when somebody says, how do I get better at magic? Play a lot of magic. I mean, isn't that sort of like one of the fundamentals? Well, it's true. You want to have a process for how you're going to get better and you want experience and you can't replicate experience without just straight putting in the work. But there are things you can do. And the number one thing that I would recommend that isn't playing magic for specifically draft is go look at the draft viewers from the pro tour it's not an article it's not a video nobody's going to tell you to read it or to link you to it but every single pro tour they do it for a draft on day one and the 8-0 draft on day two you can look at every pick of every player in every seat and see exactly how they draft and there's usually between three and eight well-known pro players at that day two draft pod So, and you can see how the best players are drafting and you can see how they're drafting based on the way that the other people around them are drafting. Usually somebody will get out of a draft and go, that guy next to me was an idiot. He went black when he wasn't supposed to go black. Right. But the beauty of the draft viewer is you get to look at that person's draft and see what colors they drafted and why they drafted them. And you'll often see people draft really well in their seat, or you can see mistakes that people made. And so I think that that's the best thing you can look at. Yeah, that's really cool to be able to reverse engineer that. On top of it, you know, the way it's shown to you is you get to see the whole pack and then you get to see what card they took. So you can play along as well, like if you don't happen to know how the draft went already. And on top Mm -hmm. of that, we do have video, like we usually will cover one and or oftentimes two of the drafters in the featured pod. So even after you've gone through and looked at the viewer, you can go back and watch a Long just to sort of uh, see how it unfolded in a real life setting. There's a lot to begin there. I like that a lot. Luis, we always say that like one of the reasons why we like Magic Online so much is just because it simply allows you to put in a lot of volume. Is Sigurd just up against it here with with not really being able to play that much? No, actually, it's kind of funny. We were talking about uh, streaming <clears throat> because I think streaming is one of the biggest changes from when I was trying to get better at magic like you know, first starting out into now. Like there were articles then and you know videos are also actually pretty good, but streaming and videos are basically the ways that you can watch a player walk through their thought process. Like yeah, it, it varies. You know, sometimes you're gonna watch someone like stream, you know, myself I'm guilty of this too. You're just like playing for fun and like kind of doing nonsense. But a lot of the times, you know, the streamers will talk through exactly why they're doing what they're doing and getting to watch like, you know, Owen talk through his thought process is like super valuable. You would never get to see that. Like you never, like when Kai was at his peak, there's no way to watch him play and talk through what he was, he was thinking. You could maybe just watch, you know, a match of pro tour coverage and that's about it. Now you can, you have access to some of the best players in the world or the actual best player in the world. And you can listen to why they're doing what they're doing. And that's just, I think a huge edge that you should take advantage of. So I think streaming and videos in particular are really, really good. Uh, Articles can be good too, but I think that streaming and videos are the closest you can get to actually playing because you're watching a game play out in real time and you can hear a lot of why someone is doing exactly what they're doing. You, you know, one of all, the, go, go ahead, Owen. I'm also going to add that not only is there a wealth of good content out there, like you could just watch anybody play in a draft video or in a feature match in which they drafted or played with their draft deck or the draft viewers or the streams. There is unlimited hours. You could you could conceivably never finish watching all the footage of the great players play. And so you've tried, right? I, 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 I put a <laughs> dent in it. I put a serious dent in it. And I love that stuff. I can't get enough. And yeah. so for anyone who wants to watch Magic played at a high level, 
there's unlimited material out there for you. Yeah. One other thing I wanted to add about the streaming thing, uh, Luis, to your point, was the, the one dimension that you didn't mention is that you can even ask. Like, <laughs> it's, oh, you yeah, know, if that, you watch a video, really good point. yeah, like you can even just type in the chat, Owen, why did you take this card over this card? I thought this other one was better. And Owen, you know, if he doesn't ban you, will say, hey, <laughs> this is why. <laughs> you're taking the uh, on stream when you're talking about. Yeah. The, <laughs> um, the one thing that I did want to add for Sigurd here as well as a possible option. It was something that used to happen among our listener base more in the old Magic Online client, which had a little bit better support for the clans that are on there. But it does still exist. And I think that if you build up just a small network of, of people around you, or maybe you start it yourself um, on the maybe on the LRCast subreddit or something like that, is that, you know, you you save all of those draft decks automatically. And in the world of leagues where we're not really as concerned with, um, you know, in, in pod play versus out of pod play, since we're now mainly just playing out of pod, you know, if you've got a draft deck saved of a format and my friend on the other, you know, on my magic online somewhere else also has their draft deck saved, what's stopping you from just challenging them in a casual match for free? And saying, hey, I want to have a few more rounds with this blue-green deck that I drafted. Maybe I lost early or I only got to play my three matches in my league. And and I just kind of wanted to get a better feel for these cards. I never even drew my bomb or whatever. And you can just jam matches indefinitely. Now, this doesn't replicate perfectly what you're trying to do. But it's pretty close. And it is free. So you are getting a lot of reps with that. Now, of course, the downside is that you don't get to, to repeat the draft portion over and over again. And that's, uh, you know, uh, you're, that, that's just going to cost you. Um, but at least you can play the games with the cards and try to, you know, work on your evaluations from there for no cost whatsoever. You just have to do a little bit of networking. Okay. Let's get into our cracker pack here, gentlemen. This pack was actually given me, uh, by longtime listener, Ryan Spain. That's what it says on here. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's uh, technically true <laughs> he has been listening all right oh this smells nice oh god yes you know because Luis, i i keep falling for it but it, when i open these old packs my instinct is to just smell them and they're horrible all of the old packs bad <laughs> um okay They've let's get into bad. this they're past their expiration date. yeah d d deeply all right so uh let's get into this uh this is modern masters 2017 edition and uh we haven't drafted it yet it came out today so here we go uh first card off the top is avison's pilgrim green for a one one you can tap it to add white to your mana pool a fine card but we wouldn't expect to be first picking this would we i was happy to first pick this in innistrad not like thrilled but happy enough but in modern masters i would not be happy to first pick yeah. this. yeah it seems like modern masters very closely mimics constructed play than, than draft yes the decks are like you know not Super quite, powered. yeah, yeah, not quite fully formed block decks. <laughs> this is what they look like. Uh, Forbidden Alchemy, two and a blue for an instant. Look at the top four cards of your library. Put one of them in your hand, and it has flashback for six and a black. That's a good card, but I think it's similar to the Avacyn's Pilgrim that I wouldn't expect to be first picking it. Here's a, yeah. a hint at one of the archetypes, Grixis Slave Driver, five and a black for a four, four. And uh, when it leaves the battlefield, you get a two, two zombie, and you can unearth it for three and a black a little clunky this, but it's kind of cool it was deceptively very good when it first came out because Agreed. it looks like it's kind of whatever but then you play it and they can't kill it and if they do then they get whacked and you get two two twos out of the deal so so it's sort of like, titan. Still, still not a card i'm first picking I'm not it's just grave titan that. though right and Modern it's just straight up <laughs> yeah it's great literally yeah. straight up grave titan Gravy um, G. yeah <laughs> you, you know oh uh Luis, you know what Owen told me? Um, their testing team calls a reservoir. Uh, what is it called? Walker. Walker. Yeah, reservoir walker. What do they call it? Thrag tusk. <laughs> no, no, no. We call it thrag tusk with energy sub theme. Oh, I didn't even know that. Wow, yeah. even better. <laughs> that thing. Uh, that that thing is as close to thrag tusk as Owen is the best player in the world. <laughs> Whoa, that's a shot over the bow. <laughs> he agrees to come on as a, a guest. <laughs> Uh, strength in numbers is next. It's one in a green for an instant until end of turn target creature gets trample and plus X plus X for X is a number of attacking creatures. This is exactly the kind of card I would take once I already had a deck that wanted it, but I would never start with. Yeah, agreed. And plus, I mean, how many of those do you want in your deck anyway? One or two? Yeah, a lot, a lot like, if you're just all tokens. Yeah. All token, four or something. Four of them? Okay. Uh, <laughs> lone mission. 
Yeah, you start yeah. to get stronger in numbers as, as you really <laughs> so as, Anyway. Uh, well put. Uh, yes. Uh, lone Missionary is next. It's a uh, one and a white for a two one. And when it enters the battlefield, you gain four life. This one is clearly seated in here for this sort of blink deck that we have as, as a potential uh, two drop that you can play, pad your life total, and then have a, have something to blink later if your uh, juicier targets get uh, get killed. That being said... You know, I'm, again, I'm assuming this isn't an early pick. It doesn't seem very well positioned in this format. Like, decks are doing very powerful things. <laughs> just gaining four life, even if you blink, it's not great. Yeah. I'm, just, only. I'm just moving on. Seagate Oracle, <laughs> <laughs> two and a blue for a one three. <laughs> You're an idiot. Uh, two and a blue for a one three. When it enters the battlefield, you look at the top two cards of your library. You can put one in your hand and the other one. On the bottom of your library, and uh, this is another good target for things like momentary blink and flicker wisp and stuff. And this one I like a little better just because it is, uh, you know, getting you that card back. And in the event that the one three on the ground is is worth anything, that that's pretty darn good. Yeah, this is like the kind of card that I think is deceptively good because this was like just okay in Rise, but in a powerful format, especially a synergy driven one, this is the kind of card that's just good in your deck. Like. You know, it's, it's like preordained is better when all the cards in your deck are good, and the same is true of Seagate Oracle. So I actually kind of like this card. I do, it's too. Great. Any deck will want it. It doesn't even matter if you're beat down, you're control, you're, like, trying to be blue-white flaw. Like, you always want this card. Yeah. It, it the, the really cool part about it, too, is that it, it is giving you some selection there as well, right? It's, it's not just getting you, like, a card back. It's also helping. I mean, the, the interesting thing, I think, about cards like this is that if it said two and a blue, one, three, draw a card, you know, I think a lot of people would be like, sweet. And this is just better than that. And th that's a hard, that's for some reason it, it seems strange, but uh, yeah, I like Seagate Oracle a lot as well. Golgari Rotworm is three black green for a five, four zombie worm. And it has black sack a creature target player loses one life. I don't remember what format this was in most recently. Yeah. But most oh. recently, yeah, I played this card and it, it actually performed better than I thought it would in the format. Um, it's in Modern Masters. Is that what it was yeah. in? It was in one of the Modern Master sets? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember ignoring it for a long time and eventually being like, you know, having one of these in my deck wasn't nearly as bad as I thought. Uh, there is a strong sacrifice sub-theme in this format that rewards you for uh, having your creatures die. And also, there's a lot of good fodder for these in the form of tokens and unearth creatures. Um the downside, of course, to the to the rotworm is that it is a five mana creature. So you know, a lot of times you'd prefer your sacrifice outlets to not cost mana or not cost five mana in the first place. But still, I think you could do worse than this. Though we're never taking it this early. I, I, I assume this is not one of the stronger cards in the format. No, I wouldn't first pick it. But if my deck wanted this card, I would be happy to play two or three of them. Like a five four for five is a huge creature. And yeah. The ability is like pretty good. It really is. It really is. And especially if you're doing it for value beyond just what it says on the card. But even then, sometimes that's enough. Oh, I hate this next card. It's Shimmering Grotto. One of the more misunderstood cards. It taps to add colorless. It's a land. Or you can pay one mana tap it and add one mana of any color, color to your mana pool. It's kind of a filter land. But for some reason, people tend to think that that's free. But it's actually adding an additional mana just to be able to get that, that color out and Man, I, I I understand the importance of mana fixing in, in sets like this that have a lot of uh, multicolored spells. But man, Shimmering Grotto is a pretty steep price to pay for that. Adding an additional mana to your spell makes most spells look a lot worse. Yeah, this card is much less playable than people seem to think. It's just not a card you want to put in your deck. Yeah, and, and if you I do, agree. you can, but it just sucks, right? It's like, ugh. Media, like any of those dual lands that create your colors are, you know, 10 times better than this. I would avoid it. Uh, I like this guy, Hanweir Lancer, two and a red for a 2-2. Two, two, and uh, it's got Soul Bond. And I'm not going to read that, but if <clears throat> basically it can pair up with another creature and, and share the ability here. And the ability in this case is First Strike. Kind of cool. Um, not particularly efficient, though, at 2-2 two, two for three mana. Yeah, I can't imagine this is a card I'm happy to put in my deck. Like, I'm not really that... Happy about even even giving first strike to two creatures, like it's just not good enough. Like not in this format. Like you should be doing powerful things, not playing like slightly overrate limited cards. Right. Yeah, it's it's funny because in Avacyn Restored, when this card first came out, the power level of the cards was really low. So this was <laughs> yes. a good card. So in this format, the power level seems to be quite high. So I imagine it won't be a very good card. Yeah, that's that's my take too. 
Ooh, our last comment's a nice one. Momentary blink. Yes. One in a white for an instant. Exile target creature you control, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control, and you can flash it back for three and a blue. This is a card um, that on its own, of course, doesn't really do anything, but in conjunction with a lot of creatures that have enter the battlefield abilities can really put in some sweet work. Uh, I, I don't know how good the blink archetype is without having actually played the set, but it's the kind of card I would not be unhappy first picking because it just makes all your other cards so much better. It's like a key part in that deck. So I, I'm probably on the blink train right now. What, where, where are you at right now, Owen, if you if you had to make your pick? By the way, we haven't seen any of the uncommons yet. Uh, th th that was the run of commons there. I mean, Seagate I don't Oracle. remember there being... Uh, I would rather take a Seagate Oracle than a Momentary Blink, just because the Blink is a two-color card. Mm. But that said, like, the upside is obviously very high on certain things. Like, if you blink, like, a Mist Raven, that's not that good, it's okay. But if How you blink a Cloud you? Blazer, if you blink a Cloud Blazer, it's like, okay, now you're talking serious value. Yeah, and I mean, what about blinking, like, a Seagate Oracle? That's still a good thing, right? It's okay. It's not a particularly strong use of a card because you're taking on some risk and it's mana inefficient. Mm. But yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's it's better than not having anything to blink. God. All right. Uh, let's take a look at the uncommons. Might of Old Crosa. Green for an instant. Target creature gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. But if you cast it during your main phase, it gets plus four, plus four until end of turn instead. This kind of feels like one of the ones that they wanted to put in for constructed purposes, perhaps. But, you know, oh, yeah. limited, the card's fine, I guess, but not really what we're wanting to do in, in a set like Modern Masters, right? It's playable, but bad. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, just doesn't seem... seem spectacular. All right. This next one I would call playable, but excellent. Path to Exile, kiddos. We got oh, yeah. the nice one here. Yeah, so this is white for an instant. Exile target creature and its controller can search their library for a basic land and put it on the battlefield tapped. Yep, the best card so far. Oh, yeah, by a lot. It's just yeah. good. Like, it's one of the cards we talked about last week that are just good in any white deck. Wow. The the, the swing on these cards is, is kind of – our last uncommon is Wall of Frost somehow. One blue blue for an 07 <laughs> defender. If a, if a creature gets blocked by it, it stays tapped down for a turn. But like how did we go Might of Olcrosa, eh, Path to Exile. Holy crap, best removal spell in modern times. And then Wall of Frost somehow is our next one. So now that's not going to knock Path off the old uh, block there. All right, I'm going to uh, – we've got a foil. Of course, there's a foil in every one of these packs. It's kind of a cool one. It's Burning Tree Emissary. It costs either green, green, red, red, or red, green, however, whichever one you want. And when it enters the battlefield, you add red, green to your mana pool. It's a sweet foil. It's, it, it's a constructed card. It's not really a, a card that yeah. I, I'm, I'm, it's going to knock Path out of the way. Yeah, yeah it, it looks fancy, but in draft, this is only very marginally slightly better than a 2-2 two -two for two. All right. Our rare, or should I say our mythic rare, There, there's not that many better feelings in the game than hoofing somebody, right? You just <laughs> hoof them. Crater Hoof Behemoth, five green, green, green. For a beast with haste, it's a 5-5, five, five. and when it enters a battlefield, there's a lot of text on this card, but it says if you have two or more creatures, you win the game <laughs> in most scenarios. Uh, creatures you control get trample and plus X plus X, where X is the number of creatures you control. It's hard absurd. to say because I think the card is great. I think it's the best card in the pack if 8 is a reasonable thing to cast. Some formats, just 8 is not reasonable. Some format is easy to get to. So Totally. I, th I think right now I would take Creator Hope and just find out because it's a Mythic Rear and it's insane. But I would not be surprised at all if Path ended up being just the actual best pick. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, and I agree because if you're a control deck with a Path or even any kind of white deck with a Path, like you're pretty happy. You know, you have like a, a nice removal spell. It's good. But if you're a good version of a hoof deck with a hoof, you're like, I have one of the best decks possible in the format. Like hoof is doing right. something broken. That's right. And that's the thing that you should consider too, uh, is, you know, when you play these crater hoof decks, they really are trying to be creature based with their mana. I mean, this is the, the formula is play a couple of mana elves and get the crater hoof down two or three turns early and then 
kill your opponent. Uh, because when you, if, the, if Crater Hoof resolves, it turns those mana elves into five, six damage each with trample. The, the downside or the, the other, you know, the, the trap that you can fall into is taking mana ramp cards that aren't creatures to ramp out your crater hoof. Now, it's not the end of the world because you'll probably have some number of creatures on the battlefield, but the really good crater hoof decks are the ones that power out a bunch of Lana or Elf type cards and, and then, you know, slam crater hoof on turn six or whatever and just kill you. So, um, you know, I would play it in any deck that I thought could reasonably cast it, but like Luis said, there are definitely formats and definitely matchups where getting to eight mana in, in a reasonable time frame is, is not on the docket. So keep that in mind. But I would definitely take Crater Hoof as well. That, that card has the, the highest ceiling of all the cards that we saw there. Okay. Let's move on uh, to our main topic. We're going to have just kind of a chat with Owen here. Owen and I have spent some time together recently and had a few discussions that we thought would be uh, fun to have on the show and, uh, and interesting as well. So what we're going to do is kind of, uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about here is talking about card evaluation and how to value a card and kind of dive deep on one aspect of this. And the aspect that we want to talk about today is adjusting your card evaluations for specific decks. And uh, I'm going to kind of set the stage here and then, and then I'll open it up, uh, open up the discussion. So the baseline that we put forth on this show uh, as a good uh, way to to learn new cards and get into a new set is to listen to our set review and do one yourself and look at all the cards in the set before you even play it and sort of start to get a picture for how strong you think they are. And we use a grading system just to sort of, uh, you know, put a punctuation mark on it on the set reviews so that there's no confusion about where we really stand. And you can use whatever you want to just, you know, get the cards in kind of a ballpark area. This is a very strong card. This is a medium card. This is a weak card. And then, as you know, as a listener, we adjust right? Th that's our baseline, but that's not the end of the story. We spend the next few shows um, readjusting cards that have gone up and down in our estimation as we learn things about the format, because the truth is, is that it's just too broad of a uh, chunk of information to try to take in just by simply reading the spoiler. You have to draft and play with the cards before you start to see how they really work. So then we start to make our adjustments, and this is what you should be doing, and then you should be making those adjustments for the duration of the of the set. Basically the whole time, if any adjustments need to be made, you should be keeping your eye out for things that may have changed or things that you didn't, weren't aware of, or that you overvalued or undervalued before. But one thing that we don't talk about as much on the show, and that's what we're going to talk about today is how to change your adjustments for specific decks. So this is a, a scenario that pops up all the time in booster draft. And oh, and this is what you and I started, started to talk about is when do really good cards become bad? When do bad cards, air quotes, become good or at least worthy of inclusion and anything in between that where, you know, you're, you're drastically changing what your baseline would be for a card because of certain circumstances that you've noticed, mainly because of the, the deck that you've drafted. So why don't you start us off with that, uh, about this, this idea about changing, you know, how you evaluate a card based on the deck that you've got. So I think one thing that's really important to keep in mind is if your deck is really bad, if the draft went badly or you didn't get enough playables, you should really be trying to increase variance. And one way to increase variance is to take a really extreme stance on certain cards. Like even something as bad as a red mana for a 1-1, one -one, just a 1-1 one -one for one, or maybe like a Wily Bandar. Mm -hmm. Like if your deck is just horrible – you could play Wily Bandars and Giant Spectacles and just hope that it works, and it might work a couple of times, and you might get a reasonable record where you may never have gotten one. But if your deck is more middle of the road, which it will almost always be, you should not sacrifice power for possible, you know, short-term variants. If you have good cards, high power level, you should just be playing them. What, what do you think about that, Luis? it's the sort of thing that we've talked about many times where basically the better your deck is and the better you are, because I think how good you are also actually plays into this too. Uh, the greater your baseline win percentage is going to be, the less variance you want. The lower the, your win percentage is going to be, the more variance you want because you already kind of load a win percent to win to begin with. And uh, I think that what, what Owen's saying is basically lines up with that. Uh, another thing that I actually want to set the stage for when we're talking about this stuff too is 
higher synergy formats tend to have a lot more of this going on than lower synergy formats. Uh, high synergy formats include Modern Masters. That's a, one of the more extreme examples. Like Modern Masters is the kind of format where you could see cutting a premier removal spell from your deck because it doesn't fit your plan. Whereas in a in a set like Magic Origins, you would never do that. That was just like one of the most like bread and butter sets that I can remember. So the more weird stuff that's going on, the more that you care about card combinations and synergy, the more likely it is that, you know, red for a 1-1, one, one, like Owen said, that's a wildly unplayable card. But if you add enough, like your whole team gets plus 2 plus 0 oh, and sacrifice a creature to deal 5 damage effects to, to your deck, th that becomes playable. Whereas if, you're, if your deck is a complete, like, crater hoof focused you know tokens all this deck you could even see cutting like prey upon or doom blade from from those kinds of decks and that's just not going to happen in like the more vanilla formats but given the last couple formats you know uh ether revolt kaladesh like you we're not seeing as much this like eldritch moon like you're seeing a lot more synergy formats so this this sort of approach is much more valuable okay let's let's get into it a little bit more specifically as well because you know th there are going to be times when you don't include cards that are quite powerful. And there's going to be times where you do include cards that you would kind of consider unplayable. So if we get into the detail a little bit further, let's get into the the underlying parts that help you make this decision, okay? So for an, ex an example is when you don't include a card that would normally be very good, and why wouldn't you consider that type of card? So Owen, wh why don't we start off with that? Because <clears throat> one of the examples that you and I had talked about was uh, including a card or not, you know, or not including a card like a sweeper, um, you know, fumigate or something like that in your deck because maybe your deck's aggressive or maybe you're playing a lot of creatures or maybe you just don't really like it in the format because there's vehicles around or maybe it's a combination of these things. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, when we, you know, like when we graded Fumigate and when I've played with Fumigate, it's been fantastic. So the the concept of not including it in your deck seems foreign. It seems like a, a bad idea. And so what I want to get into is the nitty gritty on what's actually going on with the, the numbers and the parts kind of in your head when you tr try to evaluate a situation on whether you would or wouldn't, you know, cut a card like Fumigate from a deck that it wasn't, you know, as good as it normally would be in. So this is something that we talked about last week, and it happened because I watched a high-level draft and a pro player drafted a red-white beat-down, two-color aggressive deck with some vehicles and some really good cards, a lot of synergy, and they were predominantly a creature-based deck, and they decided not to play Fumigate. And I watched it, and I was just totally dumbfounded as to, as to how someone could arrive at the decision to not play Fumigate. Now, I can see that this format is worse for Fumigate because there's vehicles rolling around and because, you know, maybe it costs five mana is a reason you don't like it. And you want to play a really low land curve and it, your deck is mostly creatures. So you think that it's going to it's going to hurt you more often. And I think I think they mm -hmm. also had copies of the card Fairgrounds Warden, which plays especially bad with Fumigate because mm -hmm. it sits in play. And then when you Fumigate, they get a creature. But I think that there's just certain times when the power level of the card that you're removing is too high. Like for me, Fumigate is like a 95 out of 100. Okay. And, and then you say like, okay, there's vehicles rolling around. And you're like, okay, now it's down to a 92. And you go like, well, it's not very good in my deck because I only want to play 15 lands. Go, okay, now it's 89. And you play, you have two Fairgrounds Warden. Go, okay, and you have 18 creatures. It's still an 82 or an 80. And I don't cut cards that are an 80 because they're an 80. I mean, it's just one of the best and easiest ways to win in limited is having better cards than your opponent. And you can't cut cards of that quality and still hope to win based on the fact that you have better cards than your opponent. And so, I think that it was, mm -hmm. it was actually really sharp of this player to identify that Fumigate is worse than it looks, but it's not enough worse than it looks. Because let's say Fumigate says destroy all creatures. What if instead of destroy all creatures, it said deal 10 damage to all creatures? It would be effectively the same. Now, if it said deal four, five damage, it's pretty much the same. Four damage, sure. Three. Now you get to two damage. Now it's a pyroclasm. It's also a sweeper. Pyroclasm is also a really good card, but it's a lot worse. And so it makes sense to view a sweeper as not as good of a card, but it's still 
like the, the the power is just too high for me. Right. And that and that's what you're we're really getting to here, right? Is that when it comes to making these type of decisions, there's a lot that goes into them. Uh, you, you gave a lot of really good examples there for, uh, you know, knocks against a card like Fumigate in our example here. And but if you want to take it one step further, what we're really doing, and this is what I've always tried to do with poker as well, is to get things down to some type of number scenario. Now, un unfortunately, I don't have a, a spreadsheet or a computer program that can spit these things out, but just to help conceptualize it, I think that your example was, was quite good. You gave a baseline out of a hundred so that we have more granularity than our, our grading scale. And, uh, and, and you have fumigate very high. And then you knocked off points for these uh, observations that this player made, and they were astute. They, they were correct. You know, these observations really did make a, a fumigate worse. But again, what we're really talking about is filling in these blanks with these numbers, right? So here's, a, here's an example. If we take this exact same scenario and we say that uh, another player, uh, you know, grab, has the same exact setup and they say, okay, we'll build the deck. So if Owen sits down with this build, they're going to, Owen's going to come up with almost identical build to, to the player, but instead he's going to have fumigate in for whatever he deemed to be the worst card or, or the most cuttable card from his deck. Because when Owen sat down, he said, okay, well, fumigate's a 95. I'm going to deduct six points for, uh, you know, for the vehicles. And then he went down the line, deducted points and said, well, it's still an 80. And so an 80 is definitely better than my, my, my worst, you know, my 23rd or 24th card or whatever. So I'm going to, it's definitely going to make the cut. But another player could easily sit down and come in and say, well, in my opinion, fumigates, uh, an 80 to start with, right? Like I just don't like sweepers that much and maybe they have their reasoning for it or whatever. And then they could say minus vehicles. Well, there's a lot of vehicles. So I'm going to, I'm going to give it a big hit. I'm going to take 15 points off for vehicles. Cause I just think vehicles are what everybody wants to be doing. And then, you know, they go down the list and they get fumigate down to a 50, right? It, it, in their mind, these, these things, these factors that they came up with really knocked it down. And so in their mind, well, 50 is not as good as, as my 23rd card, which is actually, you know, pretty good. I've drafted well here. I've got a lot of good cards. And so I'm going to leave fumigate in the sideboard and maybe I'll keep it in mind and, and bring it in. And the beauty of games like this and the beauty of trying to break things down this far is that that's perfect because now the player who is right will win more. Now, this takes a long time to show and it's in it and it takes a, you know, yeah, a sample size. <laughs> yeah, it, they won't win more in any, uh, you know, specific draft necessarily. But if Owen is right, let's just say that Owen's because I mean, Owen, where did you, you know, where, where would you say that Owen, Owen is right occasionally? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So but but in this case, let's just assume that Owen and I'm assuming that you, you, uh, you know, you, you would get these type of numbers. Um, again, I know that you don't actually put literal numbers, but just for the sake of this, uh, you know, exercise, these are coming from what, from experience, intuition, that type of thing. No, it, it, it's definitely that. And that's the thing mm -hmm. that makes limited great is that you said that we can't build a program or run a su supercomputer that will tell us what the numbers are right. because the numbers are effectively impossible to discover. So I... I don't actually use a system like this when evaluating the cards, but to try to explain what's going on is I'm using intuition, I'm using experience, and I'm using what I've learned from other players. Now, if I think that Fumigate is one of the best cards in that set, we'll just call it a 97, and then I ask Huey, and he goes, yes, it is one of the best cards in the set. He might have had it at a 95 or a 98. It's effectively the same. Mm -hmm. And then I ask a new person, Reed Duke, or I ask John Finkel, or I ask whoever else. And I just Jeez, keep asking the names people. are falling from the sky here. My <laughs> God. <laughs> I just keep asking people. And the thing is, if I had it at a 95, and then Huey said he didn't like it very much, and he had it a couple of times, and it was really bad against vehicles, I'd be like, oh, okay, well – it's a lower number than the 95 that I had. I don't know how much lower. And if I ask another person and they also say they don't like it very much, it goes down for me. But when it starts high and all of the evidence that I have suggests that it should stay high, I leave it there. And I don't need to know what that number is, but the number is so high that the outside factors that lower it don't lower it enough where I don't play it. Yeah. And I think that that's the really cool part is that we're really into the nitty gritty here because not only are you saying I'm starting off very highly, which somebody might not, you're also saying, let's not just say, here's three things that are true. 
uh, you know, there's vehicles, I have creatures and, and I have two fairgrounds wardens or whatever. Let's just not leave it at that. Let's actually assign values to those because as we turn these knobs, this can change the decision dramatically, right? And, you know, there's a lot of logic to be applied to each of these. And like I said, to me, this gets down to the heart of it because it's very possible that another pro player would look at this scenario and, and have started out lower and take bigger chunks off for that. Owen's opinion is that, you know, that Fumigate starts out very, very highly and and those factors, while notable, don't knock it down far enough to say, well, I'm not going to put it in my deck. But that's – everything in Limited is arguable. I just like the fact that we can actually get down to some type of system here where you're saying, okay. Because I had this happen all the time in poker. It would, should be – somebody would come up to me and say, hey, I had a hard time with a hand. Can you help me? I'd be like, sure. And they'd tell me the hand. Or I would tell somebody else a hand that I played. And they would say something like, well, that person never would have done that with this, right? They would say they, they can't have this. We, we call it a range. They'd say they can't have this hand in their range. And I would say they absolutely could. And in my mind, that was the crux of why I found poker interesting because th there's no – we will not know. It's the same thing like like what Owen said. There is no way for us to actually find the answer to that question. So the beautiful thing about it is that the universe just gets to sort it out. I get to play the hand the way that I see fit based on what I think is true. And if I'm right more often than my opponents are, then I end up being a profitable winning player over the long term. If I'm wrong, then I don't. Or I'm less profitable or, you know, th these are all, of course, varying degrees here. And in magic, it's the exact same thing. You come up to this and everybody is – everybody like Owen recognized, hey, th these factors matter. But it might not matter as much to – in his opinion than it does with somebody else. And, and that's kind of one of the things that you're going to do. And I want to challenge – you, the listener at home, to try this on your own as well. I don't think that, you know, we don't have like a grand system here that we can just plug all these numbers into and spit out numbers. But you know what you can do? You can come up with just a little problem, just a little, you know, hey, I'm going to shoot my, my magic friend. Hey, what do you – if you had to put numbers in these slots, how would you do it? This is the exercise that we came up with or whatever. And it gives you an interesting look at how other people view these things. Um, and, and also it, it lets you, uh, spark a really good discussion, I think as well, because when there's a big gap between a player who, between two players who are both good and understand what's going on, that says something's up, right? That, that that's a real sticking point that, you know, you, you really should dive in and try to learn from the other person and from each other to try to come up with a better consensus on, on what you guys actually think. I think that the fumigate example does a really good job of illustrating when points can be true but don't affect the value of the card enough to make mm. you consider not playing it. And I think that another example of that in the other direction would be Heroic Intervention. This is a card that okay. I argue about all the time. And I would say that if your opponent mostly has creatures that don't have flying, it goes way up in value. Because the only way that they can get through is with creature combat on the ground. So it forces creature combat to happen. Mm -hmm. And it is also true that this card works really well with death touch creatures. Yes. Because they are small and the easiest way to get through them is just by attacking once. And then now the rest of the creatures can come through. And so I've had a lot of experiences where like if I have heroic intervention against blue white, there are games where I never get to cast it. And there are games against a red green deck where if I draw it, I know I will almost certainly win the game because they have no choice but to attack. And if they attack one creature at a time on the ground, I get to profitably double block each time and trade smaller creatures for bigger creatures. Plus they have removal spells like prey upon and they have burn and fight cards, which all match up really poorly against it. And so like, these are factors that you can use when thinking about a card that actually change the value drastically instead of like the Fumigate example. Yeah. And, and you know, the thing I want to point out here is that the, the, the real focus of this discussion is what Owen was saying is it changes the card drastically, right? You just made a similar list to what we just talked about with Fumigate. Right. You're like, hey, you've listed things that are relevant. Right. Hey, if the creatures are on the ground, it, it's better. If I have death touch creatures, it's better. But what most people do is just sort of use those as like check boxes rather than a sliding scale. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's what we're really trying to get to the bottom of here. Right. Is, 
you've recognized things that are true, but how true are they? And and you've said it. I mean, you, you told us you think it gets dramatically better. In other words, you're putting a lot of weight on those things about looking at it and saying, okay, my opponent's playing creatures on the ground and I have two death touchers in my deck. You, you're saying, you know, I'm ratcheting up those knobs quite a bit here and, and I'm really actually quite excited to have this card in my deck under those circumstances. Yeah, it's like if I have an Aether Poisoner and a Scrounging Bandar, I can use Heroic Intervention to kill a 2-2 and a 5-5. But if I have a Scrounging Bandar and an Aether Herder, I can't use the Heroic Intervention to kill a 2-2 and a 5-5. So just the difference between having an Aether Poisoner, even compared to a much better creature, it the Death Touch aspect of that means you can kill two creatures with it on defense a, a much higher percentage of the time. And when you can when you have to work hard to use it to kill one creature, it's okay. But when you get to use it to kill two creatures, it's just an amazing card. Mm -hmm. So it really is just that small of a thing that you need to factor in, but it will make a huge difference with a card like that. Louise, how does this stuff sit with you? Because I know that you're, you're very much more of an intuitive player in these ways. Um, do you, like, how does this stuff sit in your brain? So uh, one of the things that actually really uh, strikes me when we're talking about this sort of thing is your level one thinking is like a card like Fumigate. We're just going to keep using this as the example of like the nominally good card, which might change value depending on your deck. Your level one thinking is Fumigate's a great card. I'm going to put it in my deck. The, the danger zone for people is when they start looking at a card like that and they think of all the reasons why it doesn't fit in their deck and isn't good enough or you know they, they get too clever and they want to make the sweet play of like let's not play fumigate but one of the things to remember is you're still just playing limited you can still you're still playing a deck of creatures against a deck of other creatures and yes you have a plan of attacking but like it's just not always going to work out that way and i would heavily caution you from cutting great cards from your deck because most of the time they're still going to be good enough and you just have to remember that you're still just playing in you, you're generally like playing a g normal game of limited even if you have somewhat of a plan might change in a format like modern masters i think there are you know legit times when that would happen but for the most part i think pe people are more likely to, to, to do something like this when they know enough to get themselves into trouble so to get that, a little fancy play syndrome rolling along oh yeah, fancy play syndrome is exactly how you would describe it um mm -hmm. the other thing that i think is interesting is the the way Owen describes evaluating cards does actually line up with how I do it because he is talking about intuition. He is talking about stacking his intuition on top of all the people he talks to. And, you know, going back to actually our question this week from the Patreon listener is uh, you can take a look at how other players value cards, even if they're not like, look, not everyone can call up you know, John Finkel or, or, or Huey Jensen and be like, Hey, what do you think of this card? But you can see what Owen thinks of a card because he's going to stream it and getting a sense of why players like these cards and what they think about these cards is more data points. Uh, the more data points, the better. And you, you don't have to agree with them, but it is interesting to, to look at them and figure out why. And, Owen might say like, hey, I like heroic intervention in general. And then if you press him, he might have the explanation that he just had, which is a lot more in depth. But often people will say, I like this card or I dislike this card. If you press them and they can't explain why, then that's a lot harder. So you, you want to you wanna figure out why people like these things. And if they can offer you a good explanation, then you are much more likely to be convinced. If, if Owen just says to me, I like heroic intervention, but can't explain why, I'm going to be a little more skeptical. Yeah. And, you know, I, I like the idea of not being afraid to press these questions a little bit when you are having, you know, because I mean, all of us love having these limited discussions with our friends, right? I mean, we're doing it right now on the air, but all of our listeners have these same uh, type of discussions, whether it's online or, you know, with their friends in, in real life. Uh, but I, I really like the idea of, of, Pressing just one step further and asking for a little bit more granularity. It doesn't have to be one out of a hundred. You don't have to pin somebody down on a number. But if somebody comes up to you and says, well, I thought this card was good, but then I realized that, you know, there's a lot of artifact destruction in the set. So now I don't think it's quite as good as I thought before. You know, th there's a lot lost in how much worse you actually think it is. You know, like, let's take a, let's take a crazy example, like Untethered Express. And you're like, oh, when I first saw this card, I thought it was awesome. And now I don't think it's quite as good as I thought it was before because uh, people run, you know, decommission and stuff like that in their main deck. And so now I don't think it's quite as good. Well, okay, you might have a reasonable statement there by saying, 
you have lowered your evaluation of it, but the amount to which you have lowered it is really, really important because I could easily make that statement and say, but I'm always first picking it over basically every common and most of the uncommons and most of the rares and still have that statement be true that it wasn't quite the bomb I thought it was going to be because it gets natural obsolescence sometime or something. But in that case, we're taking it from a 90 and turning it into an 87, right? Where somebody might listen to you and say, well, they don't like that card anymore because humans are like that. We, we don't, we, we're not good at being granular. We're much better at being black and white. And they might just look at it and be like, Oh, well, Marshall said he, he didn't think it was as good as he thought it was. And they took what, what I said or what you said as it was a, an 80 or, you know, it was a 90 and now it's a 65. Even though that's not what you were really saying, you were just making a, a, a point that it does die more often than you originally thought. And I like the idea of kind of holding each other to that, to a little bit more about saying, well, how much are we talking about here? Is it a lot worse or is it a little worse? Because like if I made that statement and then somebody followed up, I would say it's a little worse. You, you're still taking it, you know, every bit as you know highly as you would before. It's just something to keep in mind as you play the format or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I love this ahead. example because – if if somebody was to get an untethered express and then play with it once and have it die to a decommission, or even or even twice in a row, that could happen. They might think, well, this card's a lot worse than I thought it was. And then they might have a couple of drafts in a row where they get a shock and, and shock does some nice things for them. And they go, wow, shock seems really strong in this format. And then they open a pack with a shock and an untethered express, and they have one of the cards which looks worse and one of the cards which looks better, and then they'll just take the shock. But yeah. that would be a terrible mistake to make. Because you can acknowledge that the shock is better than it looks and the tethered express is worse than it looks, but come on. Right. It's still it's st come on. Come on. It's, it's still on tethered express. You have to take it. It's it's so good. Uh, we're at the come on section of the argument. Yeah, but but th that is a perfect <laughs> Just read example. the cards. Yeah. Give me a break. Um one more example that I have. Um, for this type of thing, it's a little bit different because uh, we've been taking more specific type of cards. But one of the things I mentioned at the onset here is that, you know, one of our goals on the show is to remind people to constantly reevaluate the cards as they work their way through the format. When you gain new information, you apply that to each of the cards and it might be based on what color the card is. You're like, well, red is better. So even a mediocre red card has jumped up a bit for me. Um, it might be that one, one color is getting overdrafted. So you're going to, uh, lower that, you know, it, you're just constantly should be, uh, considering these possible changes. And, you know, one of them that I heard, um, going back to Kaladesh and certainly carried over here as well, were cards like revoke privileges, caught in the brights, malfunction. These, you know, we call them pacifism effects after the original type of uh, effect for this. But, you know, these are removal spells that effectively keep the creature on the battlefield, uh, oftentimes until the game ends. And, you know, again, another example of this is that people noticed that these cards weren't quite as good as they normally are. And the reasoning for that was pretty straightforward. There were answers. People were main decking naturalized effects uh, that, that we talked about earlier, like decommission um, <clears throat> and uh, an appetite. And on top of that, there's blink effects that ended up being playable, right? Uh, it, especially from Kaladesh, you could play, uh, what was it called? Uh, whatever acrobatic maneuver, you yeah, know, to... Yeah, that and, and you could play aviator mechanic and there were ways that were main deckable and often played that would neutralize your card and, uh, and, and, and let them get their creature back. And this was certainly worth noting that this was a, this is a, a, a an aspect of this particular environment that, uh, that wouldn't normally be true. Normally, if, if you're playing a core set and you take pacifism, the cards, the creature's kind of gone. Like they just weren't really ever coming back, uh, from that. Uh, the creature was just basically, you know, for all intents and purposes, dead. And that just isn't the case here. But again, I've heard people overreact in this way and say things like, well, I, I don't like those cards very much because they get naturalized or they get blanked. And to me, that's a, classic case of exactly what we were talking about with the with the prior examples which is that to me you know a card like caught in the brights is a good card like that starts out as a high pick one of the best white commons if not and i will knock it down half a notch right i'll give it a little knock for the fact that it doesn't just unconditionally kill something in this format but heck it's still quite good and i'm not yeah, ready to just bail on the thing 
do is they confuse not as good as normal with not good. Yes, that's it. Yes. And it that's is not as good as normal, but it is still good. <laughs> you, you, you took a card that was great and adjusted it down to, I think, just medium. Like, it's still playable. It's still fine. You didn't take a card and make it go from good to not good. You just made it go from good to not as good. And I think part of, you know, the... <laughs> Part of the underlying topic here is actually granularity. It's actually having a, a scale and not just binary, not just saying card is good or card not good. It's like, how good is each card? And people often very frequently like to just put cards in two different buckets, good or not good. And that's just not how card evaluation works. It's just a lot more fine tuned than that. Yeah. Th these cards, they, they do change in value because when you play against red green, they can make like a six, six lifecraft cavalry. And Caught in the Brights is such like a clean, efficient way to stop it. It's probably your, one of your best cards that you could have in your deck when your opponent makes a 6-6 six, six trample. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, like you still want to always play it. Like those situations still come up. Somebody could play a Gifted Aetherborn or – and then you've neutralized their best card. It's Free Jam Region. Boom. That mm -hmm. is – Free Jam Region is the best card. You would lose to it unless you had Caught in the Brights. Because you had Caught in the Brights, you get to keep playing. And so for these reasons, I would still always play them. But – it's good to acknowledge why they aren't as good and change your play. One really common play pattern that came up for me was people would play turn five airdrop aeronauts and caught in the brights looks like it's a good answer because that's such a big creature and it's hard to attack through, mm -hmm. but it only takes a couple of times in a row of you playing caught in the brights on that creature and then them playing acrobatic maneuver, felidar guardian or aviary mechanic and returning it effectively killing your card for nothing and replaying their guy and getting five life and because the airdrop aeronaut is a high value pick that somebody gets early in a draft and it's a pick that once they have it the blink cards go up in value it's not like they're like a red white beat down where if they see an acrobatic maneuver they may not even take it it's if they have that card people will pick the blink cards high and always play as many as they can get so knowing when to not use that card and have the game play out in a more natural manner where they might just play that blink card anyways. They might just play the AVR mechanic as a 2-2, two, a two, couple of turns down the road. Now you play caught in the brights and things come, go so much better for you. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, it is important to remember that these things do legit come up sometimes too. Uh, you know, an example I came up with uh, for a card that could lose a ton of its value and maybe even not make the main deck, though I, I would guess that it probably still would, is a card like Winding Constrictor. You know, th that's a card that has such an absurd top end on it that in the right deck, it might be the best card in your deck, period, right? It could just be your absolute number one card in the deck that enables some of the most broken, stupid stuff that you can do if you've got a lot of plus one, plus one counter. So, you know, people take that card highly. They try to force it into those colors. But if I showed you a green black deck that had literally no plus one, plus one counters, Winding Constrictor's value goes down sharply. Now, it's still a 2-3 for 2 mana, which is a totally acceptable playable, and it very well end up making the main deck. But that and you know, that pushes it down to your, you know, your your 19th best card rather than your first or second best card. So, you know, there are times when, you know, a card that can start off very highly, as some of the cards that we've described, like Fumigate, and actually do end up plummeting in value, and maybe even to the point that you don't play it anymore. Uh, you know, the more conditional cards like cards like Winding Constrictor. So you should keep that in mind that there is a wide range that the cards can fall. And sometimes it is even out of playability if they start high. And for any of the cards that are like medium high, right? Like we're not, we're, we're talking about some of the, some of the better cards in the set full stop. But what about if it's a, you know, a solid uncommon or just a good card, right? But it's conditional. Some of those do end up falling down and sometimes they even go up as well. But again, the key is to be granular about it. And, and that's kind of what I want to put for our takeaway here for this lesson is the, the trick is yes, acknowledge the things that change the value of your cards, whether it's up or down, whether it's over the course of a set or specific to a deck that you're actually drafting and considering putting a card into. But you have to really put yourself to the test of how highly did you rate it before this? And how much worse or better should it be rated now? And and that's the, the, the real crux of this whole discussion is how much? How much? Because simply noting that it's better or worse is not enough. That is not good enough. And if you want to be the best limited player you can be, you're going to have to push yourself and likely your friends 
into committing a little bit more to how much and you being receptive to that rather than just thinking they said something bad about the card. They don't like it. That's what your human brain is going to tell you. That's what you will walk away from a conversation with where if somebody comes up to you and says that revoke privileges and caught in the brights aren't as good as you thought because these things happen. When you walk away from that conversation, your brain is going to say that person doesn't like those cards anymore. That does not have to be the case. You absolutely have the ability to follow up with your friends and your, your testing uh, partners and stuff like that and say, how much worse? Okay, cool. I'm going to recalibrate a little bit, just a little bit. And again, your brain's hard at doing that, but maybe it's a little better or a little worse, but you also have to ask them because one of the things, and I mean, we've all seen this. I mean, Owen, <laughs> you, you, you certainly have done this as well. The hyperbole stuff right? Where it's fun and it, it it helps you sort of prove your point to say something in a very hyperbolic way. That card's broken. That card's terrible. Uh, you know, it's an egregious card or whatever. But the truth is, is that, you know, for most cards, there's a level of granularity that if pressed, and I have done this with you, with both of you guys before, uh, and you've given me, you know, very good information on it, uh, you know, you will find out a lot more uh, about how much different it actually is. And, and, and that, that is where the skill really lies because the people that are good and, and, and are right more often are the ones who, who ultimately pull ahead and limited versus the ones that take this more blunt approach of, uh, of just, you know, deciding that one card's really good and, or more bad. And to be clear, this might sound like we're, we're splitting hairs, like, about like how much value there is in, in reevaluating here, but the way you get edges and limited is just having better information than your opponent, and that includes the value of cards. And it also teaches you something for the next format, which is yeah. we we see these patterns. Magic repeats itself a lot. That's just because how, how the game works. Uh, you know, there's a different kind of shock and a different kind of pacifism in like every format. And trying to figure out when these things are better or worse than normal gives you an edge. Not only in this format now, you'll have better information. Owen's practicing for a Grand Prix, and that's why he's streaming all the time. And, you know, he's getting he's getting value by having up-to-date evaluations. It also means in the next format, you can have a, a, a leap ahead of people because you'll know how to evaluate the cards better. And you'll know how to, to, to then reevaluate your evaluations and, you know, keep on going. Because all it is is just about learning and getting these small edges. So... With a lot of the topics we use, it seems like this individual topic is not something that's going to drastically change your game, but is the aggregate that changes your game. It's not that uh, you know one of the, the elite players could understand the game on a completely different level. It's that they just ha they add up all these one percent edges and then they go you know a sixty six percent win percentage and, a, and like a fifty nine percent win percentage are just a world of difference in terms of your results. And that's just the accumulation of small edges. It's not. It's not that the, the player who wins 59% of the time doesn't know how to like sequence their attacks and doesn't know how to make a plan. It's that they just, you know, they didn't evaluate, they didn't change their evaluation of these cards. They didn't pay as much attention to this little thing. They didn't put, pay as much attention to this other little thing. And those things just add up over and over and again. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, Owen, what you were saying earlier too, it can also prevent you from making major mistakes, right? Like, you know, not including really powerful cards or, or just straight up misevaluating an important card right at the beginning of a format that you then carry with you through, you know, the rest of your drafts. That's a pretty major mistake. No, I, I totally agree. And I, I especially agree with the point made about once you have learned these lessons that they will stay with you for a very long time. Like once you've played with, uh, pacifism and then revoke privileges and uh, all the other ones that do that. Then you see caught in the brights and you know, you know, it's a good card because you've already played with the exact carbon copy, different costs, different ability slightly, you know, but you don't have to look at that card for the first time and think how many vehicles do I need to play this card? Because you know to just look the at it. And, zero. Yeah, of course. It's zero. Clearly it's yeah. zero. But if you were a new player or even a good player new to the format, you might you might think that. But totally. when you look at it and then you know you've cast a pacifism a hundred times before, you don't need to figure out whether or not you should put it in your deck or whether or not you should not play it because somebody else might have a vehicle or they might have a blink card. You just know that you gotta play it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's really good stuff. And uh and I hope that uh that you can take that away as well. And uh, especially when you're having your discussions with, with your, uh, the people that you trust about magic, that, that these are the type of things that if somebody just is overdoing that, you can correct them back a little bit. And if they don't offer you any granularity, you can ask them for it. And I think that you'll, you'll both become better magic players for it. Um, 
Luis, did you want to did you want to do these quick questions for Orat? Oh yeah. Uh, All right. So I put together. So oh, and here's how this is going to work. Uh, you you just give me one word answers, whatever comes to your mind first. <laughs> oh God, this could get ugly. Let me get my sensor button all fired up. <laughs> is one of my answers going to be malasadas? Uh, it depends on it depends on, on what you what you think. All right, favorite, all right hold on a minute. Now I want to figure out. Okay, go. I, I'm I'm thinking about which one he might say malasadas for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and favorite card. Pack rat. Best player. Me. Best format. Seal. Best casual dining restaurant. Chipotle. <laughs> it was Not either Chili's that or wow. Chili's. Yeah. <laughs> That's very good too, but I had to go with Old Faithful. <laughs> Most overrated anything. Uh, <laughs> exercise. <laughs> <laughs> How is exercise possible? That's reason? so bad. <laughs> oh man! All right, best pick one, pack one, and eat the revolt. Uh, the uh, I know the name Harvester. of this card. Ether's for Harvester. Yes, it is. It is absolute. No, 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 no. no Ether Wind Basker. Ether Wind Basker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people say Herald of Anguish and they say Ether's for Harvester, but that Basker, man, holy cow! You put it in play and you win the game. It's like a twenty twenty trample. All right, all right, what is that? <laughs> Favorite LR co-host. Ooh, uh, John Laux. <laughs> that that was supposed to be Malasadas, I think. <laughs> Best nickname on the Pro Tour. Ooh, Huey. All right, that plays. That uh, was wrong. Favorite... It's T Dubs, but. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, favorite holiday. Oh, Ratsmas. <laughs> yeah, that's the answer I was for. Unlucky. Me. <laughs> Lucky. Me. <laughs> I, was hoping, I, was, I was looking for the answer to be me actually for lucky. yeah i'm sure oh, you were. oh could i say that yeah <laughs> you <laughs> unlucky me lucky you all right and and this wasn't actually the sign off as much nonsense as it sounded like marshall what, what do you got that's for? right all right so let's end the show officially here um first things first uh owen thank you so much for coming on to the show we love having you on and uh and your insight um where can people find you uh, on Twitter and on your stream as well? I'm on Twitter basically 24-7, and I'm attempting to be on Twitch 24-7. I've streamed every day for the last couple of days, and I plan to stream every day next week. And once I get the ball rolling and you know get, a, get everything going, I'm going to stream as often as I can. Yeah, this is super cool, man. I'm excited for you because I've really been enjoying your stream. It's it's entertaining and informative, which is a tough uh, mix to hit, and uh, and I'm really kind of excited that you're you're pushing in that direction. Also, for those of you listening, uh, I will have links to both Owen's Twitter and his Twitch stream in the show notes. So if you want to just go there again, you just hit the follow button, and whenever he goes live, you'll uh, you'll see. And then uh, you know, if you like it, you can join the Rat Pack, as it were. That's what he calls his subscribers. Um, oh, and thanks again, though. Uh, I will, of course, we'll have you on, uh, you know, the next time that we can, but we really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, and I'm going to do my best on my stream to not go on rants about how specific things are bad, like books and exercise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't get Owen going on books. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll tell that story another time. <laughs> um, that is going to do it for the show this week. Uh, if you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. Uh, you can, of course, uh, find everything related to the podcast at lrcast.com, all the links for everything, our streams and the, the YouTube channel and all that kind of stuff. I also want to thank our sponsor, channelfireball.com. Make sure you check them out for everything you need, magic related. A um, lot going on at CFB these days, lots of exciting stuff. Um, but you know what? My favorite thing, free content. You can watch Owen. Play limited, play constructed. You can read articles, all that kind of stuff from Owen and a lot of the other best players in the world for free on channelfireball.com. That is going to do it for the show this week. We'll see you guys next time. Okay. So, <laughs> so what we've got here is a showdown of epic proportions. We've got Let's Stump Vargas Arena Edition. We've thrown both Luis and and Owen into the arena for some Lensed Up Vargas, and we're going to find a winner here. This is a monumental matchup as well because these two are absurd with card names and images and memory for, for this type of stuff. So what we're going to do is 
We're going to start things off with you, Owen, and I'm going to kick Luis off the call, and it's going to be just you and I to go through ours. But when we come back on the other side, it's going to be Luis entering the arena. May the best man win. (laughs) Owen, you are now going to be thrown into the arena with Luis Scott Vargas, and we're doing a Let's Stump Vargas where you have to tell me what these cards do from two random old sets and uh, we've kicked Luis out. He, he's no longer in the room here uh, on the show so that we can uh, get Owen's answers for these two. And then uh, we'll, we'll, when we come back, we'll have uh, Luis in here and we're going to compare and crown a champion. So, Owen, are you ready for this? As ready as I'll ever be. Oh, yeah, buddy. <laughs> All right. So I've, been, I've been training for this moment my whole life. <laughs> Dude, I've seen you do the the MTG quiz thing. Now, that gives you artwork, which you will not have here. So this is another level. But you are absurd at that. And frankly, so is Luis. So this is – I'm really curious to see how this goes. This first one, I, I don't – do you go back this far? This is Mercadian Masks, Owen. Does that make you nervous or excited? Uh, I'm a little nervous. All this right. is the actually when I learned to play Magic was when this set came out. So, so I don't were... know if a lot of the names will stick, but I have played it when it returned to Magic Online. Okay, well, we'll, we'll see how it goes. This, by the way, this pack was given to us by Matt Britton. Thank you, Matt. All right, here we go. Also, I learned my lesson the hard way, uh, Owen. Uh, I like the smell of new cards. Mm-hmm. Old packed cards do not carry that smell well. <laughs> you <laughs> also, don't want to go there. Mask is probably stuck in somebody's basement for a few years. Yeah, uh, they they smell just like really harsh chemicals. Okay, I'm <laughs> I'm gonna track how many you're getting right, and I'm 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 pretty I'm the arbiter. It does you don't have to read it word for word. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll decide whether you've got yep. it right or not. All right, here we go. God, I, these are so hard. <laughs> Furious assault. Uh, it's two and a red. That's right. Enchantment. Mm-hmm. I think it says, like, whenever a creature comes into play under your control, you do one damage to a target opponent. Yeah, that is correct. It, I don't know if they've errated. It says whenever you play a creature spell, it might be cast, but whatever, you're getting that. Nice work. Because uh, I got to tell you, buddy, I Furious Assault is the most... Uh, generic sounding card ever, right? Like, there's like a, you can see an alien guy, his back, he's looking at explosion, maybe. That's exactly it. Oh, yeah. God, this yeah. is going to be good. All right, how about Giant Caterpillar? Oh, man, I definitely know this. I think it's three and a green mm-hmm. for three, three. Yes. And you pay a green and sacrifice it, and you get a one, one flying butterfly token. <laughs> You're totally right. You even knew what kind of token it was. I uh, almost said insect, but a caterpillar makes a butterfly. Come on. Yeah, and interestingly, the giant caterpillar itself is an insect. Uh, all right, how about this one? Sacred Prey. Sacred Prey. Wow, uh, this card is bad. Holy it, crap. It, it might be just a white mana for like a 1-1. One, one, maybe first strike, but I don't think so. It's worse than that. It's it's green. Uh, I don't know it. All right, so it's. I'll, I'll just tell you. It, actually, I'll, I'll leave it aside. We'll see if Luis gets it when it's his turn. But holy crap, that card's horrifically bad. It, it's interesting because it, it shows you how far they've come with design for limited cards. I'll just tell you. It's green for a 1-1 one, one beast, which is already weird. And... Mm-hmm. When it becomes blocked, you gain a life. <laughs> it's like, what? So you, what? like, probably one time? All right, next is, uh, this is a strange name, Cave Sense. Uh, Cave Sense? Yes. Is it like in, oh, those scents? Uh, no, like, it, it, like, um, like you have a good sense for caves, like a scented candle, like a scented cave. No, no. Like, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, in this case, yeah. it's, it's not like eyesight or hearing, but they're oh, saying man. like, you have a sense for caves. Like you can, I imagine. for example, work your way through caves. Uh, I, I definitely don't know it, but I would imagine that it's an aura, a creature aura. That is correct. I don't, I don't know what the card does. You can work your way through caves so it's one in a red aura enchanted creature gets plus one plus one and can't be blocked by walls mountain walk. mountain walk yeah oh it was right God. through those caves all right oh. next is alabaster wall oh i know this two and a white for oh four defender it's a wall tap prevent one damage to a creature player yeah that is correct wow these cards are so annoying to play against aren't they yeah 
and good to play with. All right, what about dehydration? Oh, come on. Two, three and a blue for an aura uh, enchanted permanent remains tapped. Uh, close enough. Creature, it's enchanted creature, creature. creature. Yeah, it is creature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. So it's like strictly worse uh, malfunction, isn't it? Yeah, it's sleep paralysis. It's that, but it doesn't tap. Yeah. Um, Peat bog. Peat bog comes into play tapped. It's a land. Mm -hmm. And it comes into play with two depletion counters. And you <laughs> tap it and remove a depletion counter to get two black mana. You are correct. Uh, there is another line of text. Oh, if, if it has no counters, you have to sack it. That's right. Uh, wow, nice work. Uh, Undertaker. Oh, this is easy. One and a black for a 1-1. One, one. Uh, you pay a black and tap it and discard a card to return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand. That and is I'm correct. Gonna, I'm going to say – I'm going to guess it's creature type Undertaker. Uh, it says Spell Shaper, though I don't actually know if that's been eroded or not. But yeah, yes, you, you are 100% correct though. This is really interesting because I'm looking at the pile of cards that you've gotten correct – and they all seem to be uh, some level of playable. Yeah. <laughs> and the two ones that you haven't are horrifically <laughs> bad. Yeah, that doesn't line up. That's consistent. Yeah. Uh, buoyancy. Oh, I know what this card does. I know what it looks like. I think it's one in a blue. Yes, it is. It either It's an aura, and it either gives flying or hexproof. Okay, it gives flying, and there is one other line of text. I'm not going to know it. You can play it any time you could play an instant. Describe the artwork for me. It's like a god. It's like a merfolk mermaid, like in a bubble. Yes. Kind of like going sideways. <laughs> it's all actiony. Yep. You're getting credit for that one. Yeah. That is incredible. Uh, Cavern Crawler. Ooh, this is two and a red for 03. Yes. And it has Mountain Walk, mm -hmm. and you can pay a red mana to give it plus one, minus one. Correct. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, wow, this one's kind of crazy. Deepwood Drummer. This oh, guy's, this guy's going ham. One and a green for a one-one. You pay a green and tap it and discard a card to give target creature plus two plus two. That is correct. Uh, Charmed Griffin. Fuck. By the way, we are now into the uh, uncommons. I, I moved them to the back as I I didn't realize this, but they're actually at the front of the pack. What's? <laughs> yeah, that's weird. No sweat whatsoever. Anyway, yeah. So this is our first uncommon. It's called Charmed Griffin. Oh man, it's definitely three and a white for a two-two flying. I'm gonna guess vigilance. Uh, you're you're on the same. You're in the right ballpark. Uh, so it's three and a white for a three-three flying. It's actually got a drawback. It's like whenever an enchantment comes into play, you put it on top of your library. It says whenever Charmed Griffin comes into play, each other player may put an artifact or enchantment card into play from his or her hand. Wow. In the Hunted Wumpus cycle. Indeed. Uh, close Quarters. Oh, man. Wow, yeah, this is another bad card. It's an artifact, and I'm sure it has an activated ability with creatures, but I, I don't I don't know it. Close. It's an enchantment. It's two red-red enchantment. Whenever a creature you control becomes blocked, it deals one damage to target creature or player. That's pretty yeah, bad. I was never getting that. Um, Lumbering Satyr. Oh, this is... I know this one. Green, green, two for a five, four. Yes. And it involves the word forest walk. That is it correct. Say, it might say all creatures get forest walk. That's walked. exactly what it says. Yeah. Very nice. All right. This is probably the hardest because it's a rare. It's called Power Matrix. Oh, I love this card. <laughs> I, I, I'm a dog to get it all right but there because there's a lot going on. It's mm. three mana for an artifact, and you tap it to give target creature plus one, plus one, flying, first strike, Vigilance Lifelink? Ugh. So it's four mana. Oh, damn it. And it gives all the things you said, plus one, plus one, flying, first strike, but just trample in addition. Uh, all right, yeah. that's fine. Don't worry. Luis isn't going to get that one either. All right, so <laughs> final count for your Mercadian Mask is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You got ten correct, which is very wow. impressive. Uh, Man, when you get the one, when you get them right, you feel like a million bucks, and when you struggle and get them wrong, it's they they haunt you. Oh, buddy, it is a uh, the most dangerous game is Let's Stump Vargas. Let me tell you, and and you know what? As the host of of Let's Stump Vargas, this is not lost on me. I, I tried to do this <laughs> myself just by reading the cards because I know like all the sets that I've done commentary for or played, I'm pretty good at if I can see the artwork. But with just the name, it just blurs together. Like that's why I was so impressed that you got. Uh, you know, what was that first, you know, 
cavern crawler and you know yeah. furious assault like these random that could just be anything all right yeah all right we've got one more pack to do before we get back to luis and see how he fares against you uh in this heads up battle this one legions son of a Ugh. <laughs> this is a hard one for you yeah, well, I you told me you also had Odyssey, and I know every card in Odyssey. So it's actually, I, I mean, do we, have I, Odyssey. Should, 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 were, wait, should we try to get Louise? No, nah, I mean, <laughs> I, I like a challenge. All right, well, we'll stick with Legions. Next time we have you on, though, we're going to totally get him and do Odyssey. I mean, look, it, it, it's not like we're cheating. If you happen to know, I mean, no, I, I literally know them all. Yeah. All right. First card out of Legions. Oh, this is just impossible. Wow. All right. This is going to be real. This is going to be full challenge mode for both of you, I think, uh, because there's because these creatures all have like multiple lines of text. Uh, Skirk Marauder is the first one. What? This was a great card. Cool. One in a red for a 2-1 goblin. Yep. It has morph. You pay two in a red to unmorph it. And when it becomes turned face up, you do two damage to target creature or player. That's exactly right. W was this the one that there was the first strike one that was like this? No. Or am I thinking of something different? Those are from Onslaught. It was Skirt C Commando and Battering ah, Craghorn. Yes, that's what it was. Okay. Yeah, this one is just straight up two damage no matter what happens. The Skirt wow. Commando was, if it wasn't blocked, it does two damage. So it was ah, just pun okay. punishment if you blocked and punishment if you didn't block. You just had to guess. Um, Glintwing Invoker. Glintwing. Glintwing Invoker, yeah. This is four and a blue. That's right. For for a 3-3, three, three, and you pay 7 and a blue, it gets plus 3, plus 3, and flying? That is correct. Holy crap. Right. Uh, goblin Turncoat. 1 and a black for a 2-1, and you sacrifice a goblin to regenerate it. That's right. Wow. Oh, huh. my God. And now you get a freebie. Nantuko Vigilante. Uh, it's a morph. For three, mm -hmm. it costs three and a green for a three two, and yep. it has more for one and a green. And when it's turned face up, destroy target artifact or enchantment. That is correct. Mm -hmm. I knew that one because it, it, they reprinted it in some modern master sets. Um, it's it's in the cube. In the cube too, yeah. Uh, Daru Stinger. Oh, uh, three and a white for <laughs> one one, and it has amplify one. That is correct. I have no. I have to literally read the rules text on amplify. Mm -hmm. I've never even heard of it. Go ahead. Amplify is you re may reveal any number of soldier cards from your hand, and it gets a plus one plus one counter for each one that you reveal. You are absurd. And it says, tap just deal X damage to a creature or player, where X is either its power or the number of plus one plus one counters. Probably power. It's it's plus one plus one counters, but yeah, to a target attacking or blocking creature, you're totally it's attacking. Your and by the way, your your. <laughs> Your recollection of the rules is more correct than what's actually on the card. <laughs> like, because they didn't use X where X equals. They just said, yeah. like, yeah, anyway. Uh, Blood Celebrant. Black mana for 1-1. One, one. Mm -hmm. Pay a black and you pay a life to add one mana of any color to your mana. Cool, that cool. is correct. Yep. You have player. not missed yet. Uh, yeah. Whipgrass Entangler. Two and a white for 1-3. It's a cleric. You pay one and a white, and target creature can't attack or block this turn unless they pay one for each cleric you control. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's unreal. Timber Watch Elf. Two and a green, one, two. Tap, target creature gets plus X, plus X, equal number of elves you control. That is right. Daru yeah. Sanctifier. This is three and a white for a one, four. It has morph. You turn it face up for one and a white, and when it's turned face up, you destroy target enchantment. <laughs> oh my god, dude. You are on a sick heater right now. Um, well, this is a cool name. Oops, I dropped it. Hold on. Uh, Smoke Spew Invoker. Two and a black for a 3-1. You pay seven and a black to give target creature minus three, minus three. God, that's a nice mana sink, and you are completely correct. Uh, let me make sure I didn't... I just dropped it. Okay, there we go. Uh, Avon Redeemer. Two and a white for a two-two flying tap. Prevent two damage to target creature or player. You, I get. I'll give you one more chance to make a correction. You, you uh, got one thing wrong. I think it's three and a white for a two-two with flying. That's correct. You, you oh, said two and only, a white. Oh, did I? I'm sorry. Yeah, I know you didn't for mean sure to. It's three and a white. Yeah, because there's no way that they'd print a two and a white <laughs> back then with an extra ability. That would have just been a bomb. All right. You ready for hard mode? We're getting into the uncommons now. You are no. you, you you literally just ran the table uncommons. Now we're in the uncommons. Gem palm sorcerer. Gem palm sorcerer. Okay, this is gonna be close. Uh, 
I believe it has an activated ability of blue, blue, two cycling. And when you cycle it, all your wizards get hex proof or shroud rather. And then it's one and a blue for a two, two. Uh, I'm, fa- I'm hazy on this one. Yeah. You're in the right ballpark, but this one is it's two and a blue for a two, two. It cycles for two and a blue. And when you cycle it, all your wizards get flying. So uh, you're, you're not I, getting credit for that one, but uh, I accept, we could I accept tell that, that you were right in the ballpark there. Goblin Dynamo. Goblin Dynamo. These are just oh, absurd now. Th- this card is gas. It, it's five red red for yeah. a four four. Yep. You tap it to do one damage target creature or player. You kill think, seven mana pinger, yep. And then it also has fireball. You just go X red, it does. back, deal X damage target creature or player. Yes, you're totally right. That is an absurd card. Uh, Blade Sliver. Two and a red for two two. All slivers get plus one plus zero. Oh. That is correct, and that leaves us with just one card left. It's our rare. It's called Elvish Soul Tiller. Mm. Creature type Elf Mutant. I uh, you know what I actually don't know it. All right, so this is three green green for a five four. Whenever it's put into a graveyard from play, choose a creature type. Shuffle all creature cards of that type from your graveyard into your library. That is just impossible. Wow. I've, got, I've got the art in my head. I know it, but I yep. wouldn't have ever got it based on the name. 13 and 2 you went in the one that you were nervous about. Yeah. <laughs> oh, baby. We're giving uh, Luis a run for his money on this one. Let me tell you. Okay. <laughs> That was a great performance, and uh, why don't we head back and let's bring Luis into the arena and see how he does. All right. Welcome back, Luis. So that was uh, that was Owen's run, and you, as of the time of recording, do not know what scores he got, and I'm not going to tell you either. You're going to be flying blind here, Luis, as you work your way through. So – the first so in the interest of full disclosure, you recorded the section tone before the show, and then you're splicing in here after the show, making it look seamless. That is true. Well, what are you talking about? That's not what happened. <laughs> well, we'll we'll let the users decide how seamless it actually <laughs> looked. Um, all right, I, you know it's interesting because there is some variance with you know what sets you know, and I picked some pretty old ones here too. Right. Uh, Mercadian masks. Is your okay. first one. How do you feel about that just uh, at face value, Louise? Uh, I feel pretty good about Mercadian Masks. Okay, here we go. Uh, first card. In fact, these are, these actually aren't in the same order, which is fine. It doesn't matter. Uh, Deepwood Drummer. Uh, this is one and a green for a 1-1 one, one green tap. Discard a card. Give a creature plus two plus two. That is correct. Ah, a good start for, for Louise. Uh, let me, that is uh, an easy one. Yeah, you. Yeah, that. <laughs> okay, so so Owen gets to heckle me. I didn't get to heckle him. <laughs> oh, he definitely gets. To, he he gets to really heckle you. No, no, I, I definitely won't go. <laughs> uh, cavern crawler. Uh, oh, and this is where you heckle him. If he doesn't um, answer it right away, he almost never knows. Yeah, Let's just say true. that I got this one. Is all I'm going to say about that. Uh, he did. Owen just snapped this off. Is this red for a 1-1, one, one, one and a red creature can't block this turn? I, I yeah, just, it is. It is. That's, I can't right? <laughs> now you know it's not. <laughs> All right. Uh, Cavern Crawler is uh, two and a red, O three 3 with Mountain Walk, and you can uh, pay a red to give it plus or right. minus one. Yes. So good. Starting out beyond the eight ball. All right. Uh, buoyancy. Uh, one and a blue enchanted creature is flying and can't – just enchanted creature is flying. That is true, but there is one other line of oh. rules text. I will let you. Is it, can't, uh, is it can't deal or receive combat damage? It is not. Mm. Oh, it can only block flyers. No. Oh, that's a really mm-hmm. good guess. Uh, can you describe the artwork? It's a dude in a bubble, like floating. What kind of dude? I don't know. One of those like Rashadin dudes with like the weird shoes and like a like a. <laughs> God, <laughs> this is so close. Because I had it like Owen and I went down to the down to the mat on the artwork. I'm going to give you this one. It is a dude in a yeah. bubble flying, which is the the main part. Uh, 
you can cast it anytime you can cast an instant it, it does just give flying like you thought but okay. it's just it has flash um somehow he and i got the exact contents of that card right i know got, like somewhat the art it is weird and got gives flying and missed you, you could play as instant it was very All eerie right. how close you guys were on that and, and you both knew the artwork too which is insane though owen i will say was a little closer it, it's a merfolk in there um Uh-oh. undertaker Oh, uh, one and a black for a one one black tap discard a card return a creature from a graveyard to your hand. That is correct. Uh, Pete and Bob. you and oh. no 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 and Undertaker won the Royal Rumble thirty years in a row. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> uh, anyways, P- Pete Bog. <laughs> Pete Bog. Uh, this comes into play tapped. It's a land uh, with two counters on it. Depletion, I think, and then you or and you remove a counter to add two black, and when you remove the second counter, it's dead. Uh, that is correct. You even got the counter name right, which Owen also did. Uh, dehydration three in a blue uh enchantment enchanted uh creature doesn't untap that is correct oh, Luis is kind of running it up here uh alabaster wall um i'll tell you that by this time owen had already answered correctly <laughs> <laughs> oh good god I'm getting, I'm getting massacred here it's also a card in mechanic masks by the way uh, one in a white oh six no it is two in a white oh four tap oh, preventive damage, damage. Prevent damage. Yeah, okay. also you you lose a point because massacre is from nemesis it's not from mercury oh, masks sure, oh wow getting docked here <laughs> Owen's just running it up. All right, no, yeah he really is <laughs> i can feel the sweat beads forming on luis's forehead right now uh giant caterpillar three in a green three three green sacrifice to put a one on flyer into play what kind of flyer insect <laughs> what? A caterpillar does not give birth to an insect. Uh, I don't know. Moth. It, it, it is in fact a butterfly token. You're of course oh. getting that one correct, but uh, yeah. I will say that Owen knew it was a butterfly as well. Uh, <laughs> furious assault. Uh, Good luck with this. The only reason I say that is because it's the most generic name ever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Two and a red. That is right. Uh, that was the hard part. Yeah. Well, of course it's not the hard part. <laughs> it's like, I think it's... Oh God. There's like three or four different red generic effects that this could be. Uh, I think it gives... Oh my God. Wow, this is, everything, could, everything could rely on this one furious assault. <laughs> yes. Yeah, give your creatures first strike until end of turn. <sighs> what a punt. It's uh enchantment. Whenever you play a creature, it deals one damage to a player. Oh yeah, okay, I had no idea. Alright. Uh cave sense. Uh one in a red enchant creature gets plus plus one in mountain walk. <laughs> yeah, that is hundred percent correct. <laughs> He knows Owen, it he, plays Owen, it he, in every he got it. Yeah, <laughs> it was funny because the the first few cards that Owen didn't get were just stone unplayable, and this was one of them. And you just snapped it <laughs> off. Uh, well, uh, so you are right, though. If I if I know a card, I get it immediately. Uh, otherwise, I'm almost always dead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is, of course, the the Owen zone when he gets to to talk smack as yeah. he feels the pressure. Yeah, he feels the weakness. Right. Uh, <laughs> sacred prey. You get a hint with this one. It is horrific. Yeah. <clears throat> green for a one on one and dies you gain a life jeez that's close wow all right you get you need to make an amendment to this because that is not correct but if you make the amendment correctly you'll get it and i'm going to give you a hint the amendment comes in the text box the it is a green for a mm-hmm. one one by the way it's a one one beast that that just doesn't mm-hmm. sit right with me for some reason but uh when it dies, you gain two life. Ah, oh, man. Can't give it to you, buddy. It's when it becomes no? blocked, you gain a life. Oh. Yes. Which is, what a horrific card. Um, lo- okay, by the way, uncommons. Starting okay. to heat up here. Lumbering Seder. Oof. 
two green green five four uh, all creatures of forest walk yes wow what, what kind of slow roll was that were you just trying to yeah, lure I Owen in <laughs> I, I was just trying to accept uh, you knew I, I, I knew, knew exactly that. What that yeah was. yeah you scumbag i almost fell for it too because i wanted to snap that one off uh close quarters um I want to say this is a really bad red enchantment. Uh, you are correct. Is, <laughs> it's like three in a red enchantment. You you can't activate abilities during combat. Something like that. No, I don't know. You, that so, would be a really bad card. Yeah, it's two red red for an enchantment. Whenever a creature you control becomes blocked. Close quarters deals one damage to target creature or player. Ooh, horrific. All right, two more cards. First one. This is our last uncommon. Charmed Griffin. Uh, two in a white, three, three. When you play it, sack unless you have an enchantment. Let's see here. Uh, say it again. Two in a white, three, three, flyer. Uh, if you don't have an enchantment, sacrifice it. Is that what you said, Owen? No, mine was I said three and a white for two two flying vigilance, which is not even close. Right, that you you just guessed. So it is in fact three and a white, three three flying. When it comes into play, each other player may put an artifact or enchantment card into play from his or her. Oh, hand. So I wasn't right either. You All are right. not. Yeah. All right, you have one more chance to redeem yourself, Luis. Power Matrix is your rare. Ooh, four mana artifact tap. Give a creature plus one plus one. And this is the important first, part. <laughs> first strike, trample and flying. That is correct. Wow. wow. Well Unbelievable. Done. <laughs> so what's, the score, what's the score going into? We have two packs, right? Yeah, we have two yeah. packs. Uh, should, should we just do overall? That's what we should do, right? Just whoever. We should got, do overall, but I want to know yeah. what's, what the what, what All the right. score I, is. I am going to tell you that. Uh, so you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine correct. That means that you got six wrong. Owen. After his first pack, which was of the same at Mercadian Masks, got 10 correct and five wrong. Yeah. You are trailing by a mere okay. what, card. What's the second? Now, the second this is card? a thing that I don't know what Luis knows, but I'll tell you what. Owen was pretty unhappy when I told him what this pack was. And okay. it is Legions. Ooh, Okay. I feel like this is in Luis's wheelhouse. Oh, yeah. give, give me, give me a, just give me a, a little litmus test here, Luis. Are you feeling confident or not confident about Legions? Like, have you, have you drafted I, it? Uh, I have drafted a substantial amount of Legions. I feel very confident. Oh no! <laughs> Hang on, buddy. Here we go. All right, Avon Redeemer. Uh, three and a white, two two flying tap prevent two damage short creature or player. Correct. Smoke spew invoker. Two and a block, three, one. You can pay uh, eight. Target creature gets minus three, minus three, till on your turn. Come on, don't cop out on me. Y are you uh, saying it's eight generic mana? Yes. That is incorrect. Wow. Is it seven and a block? It is. Ugh. I might give you that one. I'm thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, come on. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll eight, put that on eight, the fence. Yeah, I'm, that, it's that in the one, middle that right one, that one feels, I feels think I should give that one to him. But uh, I did yeah, also yeah. press him, and he like kind of semi-confidently said yes. Mm -hmm. I don't try to trick you. You know, I don't I do not do that as a completely impartial judge. Um, Daru Sanctifier. Uh, three and a white, one four. Morph, morph cost one and a white. When it turns face up, destroy target enchantment. That is correct. It's good. Timber Watch Elf. Two and a green, one, two. Tap target creature gets plus X plus X. X number of elves in play. And it's an elf, obviously. That is correct. Uh, Whipgrass Entangler. Um, two and a white, one, three. Pay one and a white. Target creature can't attack or block unless they pay one for every cleric you control or every cleric in play. That is correct, man. Owen got that one, too. I don't know how the hell you guys remembered that. Uh, Blood Celebrant. Oh, this is a bad one. Oh, it's real um, bad. Oh, it's real bad. Black for a 1-1. One, one. That is right. Uh, I'm sweating these so hard. I know. It's so good. 
Uh, I'm writing black down. Black sacrifice Owen's it. Target player. target player. If your opponent loses two life and you gain two life, that is incorrect. It no. is black. Pay a life. Add one black. Uh, excuse me. One man of any color to your mana pool. Uh, that sure. is going in the no camp for sure. Uh, okay. Dar- Who's Dar- these fixing? Daru Stinger. Uh, three and a white, one, one, amplify, and it gets plus, plus one counter for each creature that shares a type with it that you reveal when you play it, and it taps to deal damage equal to the number of counters on a target attacker or blocker. That is absolutely correct. You you nailed that one. In fact, you nailed that one so well, I'm going to give you Smoke Spew Invoker for that. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. Um, here's an easy one. Nantuko Vigilante. Uh, three and a green for a three-two morph. You can pay one and a green morph cost, and when you flip it, destroy target artifact or enchantment. That is correct. Goblin turncoat. Uh, one. Oh, one and a black two-one sacrifice a goblin to regenerate it. Uh, that is correct. Mm-hmm. Glintwing invoker. Uh, four and a blue for a three-three. Seven and a blue gets plus three, plus three in flying. That is right. I like the correction there, by the way. <laughs> I learned. Uh, Ooh, actually, that one's eight colorless. You lose. <laughs> Skirk Marauder. Uh, Marauder. Ugh. Wow, Owen answered this one really quickly. I'll give you a hint it's a goblin. Yes, I know it's a goblin. Thank you. <laughs> That's why it's such a great hint. <laughs> oh, it's man. also a red card. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. Its illustration was done by Pete Venters. Mm-hmm. Uh, God, I feel like I should know this one. I think you probably should. This is a very good card. Wow, this card's really good, actually. I didn't even read that last part. <laughs> This no, that's not it. Uh, Do you want to come back to Skirk Marauder? I'll allow you to take a pass, and we'll do it. All right, well, if you want. I'll, I'll, I'll think about Skirk Marauder. All right, uh, Blade Sliver. This is our first uncommon, by the way. Uh, two and a red, two two. All slivers of plus one plus up. That's right. Goblin Dynamo. This one's really weird. Uh, this is like four in a red. O oh, five. No, no, no. Sorry. Erase that. Five red, red, four, four. Tap to pin yes. for one. Yes. Uh, X in a red sack. It deal X turn creature or player. That's Close BS. Enough. He was saying Goblin War Machine. <laughs> yeah, I, he, I, he can I, undo I control it. Zed. I control <laughs> He did. He did. Uh, you do have to tap it in that second ability, mm-hmm. but obviously you're still getting it. Uh, two more uncommons. Or excuse me. One more uncommon, one rare, and then that one Skirk Marauder lying at the back of the pack here. And I got to tell you right now, Oh boy, are things close. Gem Palm Sorcerer. This is this not is the, the time to miss one. No, this is the blue Gem Palm. I know that. Hold on. It's. That is correct. It is blue. It's not a goblin. It almost, it almost seems like a plant in the pack because it's so hard to get. Yeah, because like all the other Gem Palms are so easy. They're great um, and easy. Yeah. Yeah, this gem card's palm? absurdly weird. It's like. So I know it's a wizard, and I know when you cycle it, you get an effect. It's that like is correct. Two and a blue, two, three. Oh, no, no, two and a blue, two, two. Yes. One and a blue, discard it to draw a card and to give one of your wizards hex or uh, shroud until end of turn. I think that's what Owen said, too. That yeah, is that's exactly what I said. Correct. Yeah. I said all, all but not one of. Yeah. It's two and a blue for a two, two, which you got. Yeah. The cycling is two and a blue. Okay. And when you cycle it, all wizards gain flying until end of turn. Okay. What an okay. absurd card. I, yeah. it, it seems just ungettable. It's I just think, impossible. I think, I think there's literally no person on the planet would be able to tell you. Yeah, that I, I agree. Person. I don't think the person that designed that card could remember what it did. All right. Nope. Here's your rare. Elvish Soul Tiller. Oh, Jesus. Elvish Soul Tiller? So this is a stupid elf that interacts with the graveyard. I know that. Um, that is correct. What? <laughs> it is a stupid elf that interacts with the graveyard. You are completely correct. 
Oh my god. I feel like I'm gonna lose. Uh three in a green, one one elf. When when one of your elves dies, return another creature from graveyard to your hand. Oh, that just can't be right. That's not right. Oh, Owen, do you remember what this does? <laughs> I remember you got when it you wrong. Told me? Yeah, I, I wasn't even. I I literally failed to guess. I just decided to not guess because I was not even going to be close. Yeah, here's it's... what the card actually does. It's green, green three for a five four. <laughs> yes. Somehow an elf is just a five four for five, <laughs> and it says when it dies, you can exile it, and you name any creature type, and you shuffle the creatures of that type from your graveyard back into your library. Oh, whatever, I can't just take them off. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you have one more shot Marauder. at Skirk Marauder. He's back. What does what the score is coming into this? So you were down one coming in. Mm hmm. Owen. Went thirteen and two in legions. Jesus. And for so the record, he, I got, he has I got it locked. Wrong. I got wrong the elf rare and the wizard cycling card. He did. So you got those two wrong. Where, oh, I got blood settlement wrong. That's the other card I got wrong. Yes. You were close though. One per one one. So are you going to guess it, Skirk Marauder? It I'm is. It, it, it is. It is only a pride point. I, I'm off Skirk Marauder. All right, I'll read it to you. It's one in a red. You're going to be. You're going to kick yourself when you. You will, because this is a good card. One in a red for a two-one goblin with morph. Two in a red when it's turned face up, it does two damage to anything. Oh yeah, I knew that card. God, yeah, of course. Definitely. It was, the best, it was probably the best red common. Four, five, uh, six. No, seven. zombie, zombie cut. There. No, that wasn't that set. That was the next one. <laughs> zombie cut. That was the best common in every color. Uh. <laughs> All right, so you went eleven. And four for a combined score of 20. And the winner of the first showdown is Owen Turtenwald with yes. 23. Wow. He's going to walk away with the trophy, Luis. How do you feel having let him come into our house and take away the hardware? Good night. <laughs> <laughs> for the record, I'm a little hurt when you introduce me and you list off my accomplishments. You didn't mention any of the limmies that I had won. By the way, that was Luis hanging up on us. <laughs> he is just gone <laughs> oh he joined he rejoined all right we heard the sound Luis. the the skype sound went <laughs> all right well to be clear that's intentionally hung up that was not a that was not a glitch <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right well congratulations owen you won this one Luis. you've got a little practice to do before the next one but i have faith that you will you will take okay, the crap back. Back. oh there will be a rematch but in the meantime owen gets to talk crap for the entire stretch so it's not even there. I, with those sets picked, Luis is so much older than me. He should have known those cards. <laughs> oh, the rabbits are coming. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs>